This is Written Off, the show dedicated to recycling the refuse of pop culture. We'll sift through other people's garbage and sometimes, like today, our own. To re-examine stories both overhated and underappreciated, minus all the hot takes and the rage bait. We'll champion the narratives that don't fit the narrative, all while killing the sacred cows of the zeitgeist. Like any good story that actually honors those things that have gone before it, we aim to challenge and inspire and maybe, just maybe, give you something to think about. My name is John Walsh, and I'm a writer, editor, and educator by trade. And I'm Josh Howard, artist, writer, and comic book creator. And today, arriving on our slate is this. This, this was not supposed to happen. <laughs> this was not in the forecast. Uh, this did not way go the when. way that we thought it was going to go. <laughs> Yes. Um, there is already more video essays discussing this particular movie than has ever needed to be written. Josh and I both very much thought, but th what what is there to say there, that hasn't been, been said? said right. Yeah. right? Good, bad, indifferent, all of it. it. Just there's not a new thought to be had. But in the name of thoroughness, since we were talking about the sequel trilogy being written off as a whole, it only means that each and every part of it must be given its due course. And so we are. The way we approach this is uh, this past week, Josh and I have sat down and watched The Last Jedi, even though the last time he and I watched it, I think we both looked at each other and said, well, I think that is the last time we will ever need to do this when we did a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back marathon of the sequel trilogy. Uh, but then when you continue to see this kind of just all of the great things about the sequel trilogy being just written off all in many cases because of this movie or because of fallout from this movie we we said you know what we we'll do it we will go in and so uh truthfully the goal was to go into this with as open a mind looking at the trilogy as a whole. And so things that might have, uh, we might have written off originally to reconsider it in the context of the entire uh, trilogy and, you know, try and re examine it. So um, it will be up to you, the viewer, to decide as to whether or not we have uh, been able to accomplish that goal. But uh, I will say for myself, I had a different perspective this time uh, that may or may not satisfy some people. Um, but I can truthfully say that I did go into this with probably the most open mind, I think, is going to even be possible to watch this, this movie. Uh, even talking about the, the day going to the theater, because I do have to admit, I had certain expectations. So I, I've cleared those expectations and watched the movie just to try to take it as a film and to think about it in that uh, perspective. So take for all of that for what you will. Josh, you have anything else to add for your perspective before we uh, dive into this and, and kind of uh, step through the film uh, beat by beat uh, as we've done with The Force Awakens and we will do with Rise of Skywalker? Well, I mean, like Force Awakens, maybe a little bit of context, um, real world, real world context before we jump into it. Um, I know when I first saw the movie, I was with a group of friends, the same group that I'd seen Force Awakens with. With that Force Awakens, everyone was elated, you know. With that Flash Jedi, and it felt like a, we'd been to a funeral. Remember, we stepped outside of the theater, and everyone's standing in a circle, and everyone's just kind of like not, not knowing what to say. Like, well, we have to think about that one, right? <laughs> Um, 
And I definitely struggled with it. Like, it wasn't like hatred because I, I wanted to love the movie. Like this is Star Wars, right? Um, I remember I had one friend, I, he would, we'd have conversations about it. He would try to talk me off the ledge. It's like, oh, this is good. This is good. You know, I just couldn't really quite get there. Um, even though there were things that I liked in certain ways, but, um, and in fact, I think the general consensus, at least from my perspective, was not instant hatred, right? It may have been like, I don't know how to feel about that. It wasn't until several months later when um, certain YouTube channels began to like do, you know, very angry videos that all of a sudden things began to snowball. And the movie right. became basically just a cultural battlefield by which all other things are judged. Um, and I think <laughs> despite our perspectives, I think both sides have gotten really ridiculous. Um, oh, that that is probably the biggest takeaway for me watching this film is um, I simultaneously could not understand why anyone would herald this as like an amazing Star Wars film, but I also don't understand why someone would now dedicate their life to hating this film to the point of it basically becoming a personality trait. Like it really, <laughs> I, I, it, I really, yes. I really came to this as very ambivalent, um, very neutral, uh, which surprised myself. I did not, I did not think I was going to be able to have that perspective. Um, but I really, I think this viewing kind of put me in that place. So, um, therefore, I do not hate you, Josh, for making me rewatch the film uh, prior to this. I, I rescind my 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 hatred, which would you know lead to to anger, which would lead to pain, which would lead to suffering, and you know so on and yes. so on. Yes. So yeah, there's a lot of garbage around this movie, and it's mostly just uses a weapon now by both sides. So we're going to try to just approach this. Does it mean we're going to have, you know, right opinions one way or the other? It's going it, it to, it is definitely a mixed bag at best. We have, we have zero motive for analyzing this movie at this, for this, that we, I, neither one of us has anything to prove um, or disprove with it. it. It literally was, this is really for ourselves in a lot of ways. This honestly, for mm -hmm. me, it's how, the way I look at this viewing is, um, okay, where does this sit amongst all of this for us in discussing the sequel uh, trilogy again as a whole? So. All right. So you ready to jump in? All right. All right. Here we go. There's no turning, there's no turning back. Nope. <laughs> okay. So, of course, we have our crawl. The thing is, there's really not much has happened in between the two movies because it picks up almost immediately. Um, Although I do find it odd that it's like instantly like the First Order reigns. Like, it, it is an interesting... Like I, I, I do have to admit, like, what does that mean? Like, I, I know that they've taken out a major seat of political power, but to all of a sudden, like, the first order reigns the galaxy. I, I do think, in a way, it sets a lot of the tone for this movie. That it's a lot of the, like, feeling of it. Like, oh, it feels like the first order well, reigns. I, in, I would say, in some ways, if I'm, be, if I'm being generous, I would say that. It seemed like from Force Awakens, the general idea was that the resistance was formed because the Republic would not realize the threat of the First Order. So in my mind, they were already pretty much embedded and building up across the galaxy so that once they destroy the Republic, there's this, I mean, they're instantly, by default, the ruling power. So that's one way you can look at it, I guess. All right. Okay. See, Josh said something nice. <laughs> Um, <laughs> to counteract that, though, I mean, we start like all Star Wars movies do, like in space with a ship, but 
this breaks the pattern because we're starting with uh, the resistance and not uh, the enemy ships, the first order. Um, so this will be the first of many uh, breakings of tradition <laughs> in this film. Yeah, so we see the arrival of the, of the first order like from the ground. Um, so everything about this is, is not conventional for Star Wars. And then we get to our first big, like, um, I don't know. Basically, Hux, I found him truly menacing uh, in Force Awakens. Like, a great character, someone who really believed, you know, in this cause. And instantly, he's a parody in this movie. Like, just like a buffoon. Like, he's totally just played for yucks, right? Like, every scene he's in, like, completely undermines what Force Awakens established for him. Did you feel the same, or...? I Oh, no. It... Um, we constant... Because especially here, his speech, right, that he gives at the beginning of this, it's like... For a moment, I forgot exactly how like what was going what was going to happen. Even though I knew, it's like for a moment, like he he's so good in in playing this character that he's giving this impassioned speech, and it's like, yes, there's Hux, and then instantly it's like I I always did in my brain. This is always the like, is your refrigerator running? scene right yeah. right like it's it's like it's like the crank call and I, I if you did this once in this movie once i'd be like okay you you played that scene but this is unfortunately going to become a running theme well that's the thing with so many things in this movie it's like if it had just been this one thing i could overlook it or this two things but it's like an assault. Um, Cause there's, th there's certain things I, I was writing down when I was taking notes. I was like, is this really worth bringing up? And then I was like, well, not in isolation, but it's like a, a pattern, right? It's just like, it keeps going, but, but yeah. So this is the first of our, um, emasculated characters. <laughs> I mean, to put it bluntly. Um, so this whole scene is, you know, Poe going solo against them, taking out the cannons, etc. Um, I guess this is a good place of any to point out something that I hate that we're getting negative so soon. <laughs> um, but there will be, be balance, I promise. Um, so this movie is widely regarded as like one of the most beautiful Star Wars movies, like the most beautifully shot, all these great, and yes, there are many. Like if you freeze frame it, like some of these shots of him and X-Wing, they look super clean, crisp, well framed, all this stuff. But my argument is that is not Star Wars because Lucas worked very hard to establish a documentary style for Star Wars so that it would help the fantastic feel more grounded and realistic. And I feel like this movie is being treated like like a comic book, like a comic strip. Like you have all these like panels that you could just, you know, would easily make a great a panel, right? In a comic. And while there are some movies, well, I think that would work. It doesn't work for Star Wars because that's not the feel and tone of Star Wars. Um, so I would push back on this whole, it looks great and all this other stuff. I mean, well, there's a lot of things in this movie, right? That like wouldn't necessarily be a sin in another movie, but it's because it, it defies Star Wars convention is what makes it of the problem. That right. that is that is probably my biggest takeaway. We'll talk more later. Is exactly like what you said. This belongs somewhere else, not mm -hmm. here. Right. So the, the first order destroys the base. Um, I swear, Leia. I don't know about you. I feel like she looks like almost ten years older in this movie. Like she is noticeably aged in just the two years since Force Awakens. Like it really shows that her health was, I think, deteriorating. Unfortunately. 
Of course, that, that yeah. probably her hairstyle and clothing probably doesn't help either. I mean, they merely made her look, you know, cause they tried to make her look like she was still in her like rebel get up, you know, in the, in the last movie. And it's anyway. I just, again, this is one of those things where it's not worth really nitpicking, but it's just like, it was. It's silly, I thought the exact right? same thing. Like, I look at that and like, how does that fit in that? Exactly. Like, anything R2 pulled out, there was always like, that could make sense. But yeah, this was, I, I again, I forgot like how many, like, and it's one of those things, that, yeah, I could roll with it, but it's just like, after one after another, you, it's just kind of like right, exactly. Yeah. It it just keeps adding up. It's death by a million paper cuts. <laughs> right, right. Um, and then the the bombers arrive. Um, but I think at this point, Leia has like ordered Poe to like leave. But you know, there's some kind of conflict, which is we'll get into a little mostly later. Um. So, like, the big deal with these bombers is that they're dropping, they're actually they're actually dropping bombs in space, which on its, its face doesn't really make a lot of sense. But you have to think, well, well and you think about, I okay, think, maybe they're magnetized. Well, uh, the thing is, know. is I think they're propelled out. Is, is that they is go not down how the it is. Well, it, it doesn't right? look like they're, they're dropped. Right. I mean, but. Um, my my thing is why can you be sitting in this bay that has no shield and the oxygen isn't getting sucked out of of this area that right. like i <laughs> but again I, I i in watching it i'm just trying i'm i'm trying to like like what's like what am i supposed to be feeling here and and everything and i've tried and, and again, it's one of these things where it's like if it would feel fine elsewhere, it it just doesn't. It, it feels shoehorned into 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 Star Wars. Well, but, I can say I can say one big positive about this scene. Um, if I'm being fair, this is the only actual space battle of the whole sequel trilogy. Um. All the other ones are like in an atmosphere. True. So there's that. So there's this whole thing of like the last bomber is this character who we come later to know as Rose's sister, which is important for, I guess, her arc. But that's why there's the focus on this character. And she drops the bombs at the last minute and destroys the big ship and of course then we have this scene of completely unnecessary having hooks sliding around on the floor by snoke um just well and here's the thing is is if he had been like lifted up and like held up it would have been like a great menacing well yeah that's scene, the thing right There's but, so it, but it's like no like... we're gonna literally gonna wipe the floor with him <laughs> Um, well, there's so many things about this movie. If you just done it slightly different, it would have been fine, you know, right? It's just right. Oh no, yeah. I I insist. I could write the novelization of the Last Jedi, It'd be and amazing. it and it, it could it could be amazing, and right. and that's probably one of the most frustrating parts about it is how close and yet completely far it can it can feel. Um, I will say that the thing I one of the things I noticed about the like the bomber run earlier is I probably would love the scene if I knew who the hell that character was. Like that was the way it was treated. It was like this character that we've known and loved, and and they're sacrificing themselves, and like it plays out like that. And I'm like, I have no idea who this person is. Like, so you're being all dramatic, and I'm like. I don't know who you are, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, again, I guess because we're supposed to care because then Rose is going to care, but it, it does feel backwards. Right. Um, but yeah. things like this. It makes you feel like this is the, the last Jedi is the drunk history version of star Wars. <laughs> it's like your drunk buddy telling you the story of what happened. Right. 
Right. It, 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 prove my point. This whole thing. I mean, we introduced we introduced a Finn as a joke. Like the guy who had his basically spine lightsabered is now. This is how we're introduced to him in this movie, and it's just. It's just one after another. But then we're we're back to where the Force Awakens left off. Um, I'm not going to nitpick the fact that it's overcast instead of sunny like it was in the last movie because that, they couldn't help that. Not their fault. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she... Uh, okay. There's a lot to talk about here. But uh, she gets in the saber, and then this has been the bane. This scene has been the bane of our existence since for the last five, six years, right? Because not only is it just like so, especially after the setup of Force Awakens, it's like getting to that moment that this crescendoing, and then the two year wait, and then you get this. And the other thing, too, about it is we've talked both, we talked about this many times is that. There's ways you could have done this scene, could have made the same message without it being like he could have not taken the saber, right? He could have just dropped it. But it's the throwing it over his shoulder that has felt so insulting, right? Right. And of course, the way things play out after this movie itself doesn't really give it another context. But, and I think we may have mentioned this, I can't remember if we mentioned this last week, ending with The Force Awakens, Rise of Skywalker can give us a recontextualizing of this scene. And so I went into this with that in mind, and I will have to, I have to admit, whether or not exactly if you want to look at it the way Josh kind of gave kind of primed me to it does I do now have a read on this scene where it doesn't have have to be this way of course the biggest problem is is we've already been told oh you expect the the, the pilot to kind of you know come in and you know uh you know all of these things, these characters that were left in, in, you know, these very dramatic situations, and then now they're just kind of being treated as jokes. And then you have this. I mean, how else in the movie theater am I supposed to take this? But yeah, no, screw your Star Wars. Well, that's Shut. how it's intended. Like, right. So, right. so I'm watching it this time, and I do have a revelation. Like, I wasn't trying to make it work, but if something hit me as I'm watching this. Actually, it was as well as watching Force Awakens, actually. If you look at this scene as in Luke's had this horrible thing happen. And so he he runs to, he, get, he runs here basically to be an whatever the whatever the meaning, like exile, you know, isolation, whatever. And after all this time, this uh, person he doesn't know shows up and has this saber that he has that he lost years ago. If you look at this as Luke views this as, if you want to get biblical, the devil showing up with temptation, right? Oh, here's that saber you lost, like, because um, he's come here to get away from everything. So, you know, if you think about like Jesus in the desert for 40 days, right? And, the, and Satan sh and shows up and offers them like, you know, food and then the kingdoms of the world and all this. If you think about it in that mindset, him throwing the saber is like, I am resisting temptation. I'm resisting the devil, uh, dark side, whatever it happens to be. I think this actually works. It works really well. And so you were going to say? Yeah. It, it Even if she he doesn't know she's a Palpatine or sense it or anything like that, like, like you said, putting it as this like temptation, because it's almost the, it's like, because she'll insist later, like, you need to rebuild the Jedi Order. Like, that's what we need. So it's like that saber, that's that's what he takes it to mean. 
And of course, then she'll later, like I said, literally ask for that. And it's like, you got to rebuild the Jedi order. And it's, and it's like, like, no, I like, like, I, I, I won't, I, I, I won't do it. I won't, I not, I have made this mistake. I will not make it again. I will not mm -hmm. be tempted. Right. And so, yeah, it it does have a different feel if you uh, if you have that. And I think it's like if if the movie uh, obviously it couldn't by tradition open here, but uh, if this had been like the first scene or as close to the first scene, I think I would have maybe read it differently. But because we're already kind of primed, otherwise, but focusing just trying to be like okay just what's on the screen just focus what's there i i well i don't I can, think i can go was, with it i don't think this was intended by uh oh none i don't think i don't think anything that we have pulled out in mind out of this movie was intended by its creator and right. almost all of it comes in the context of being seen through the lens of J.J. Abrams. Like, how would J.J. recontextualize this in order to move forward with something? That's that's a lot of what got mined, at least for me, out of this movie. And I think you're pretty much the same way. And then we see the X-Wing underwater. And what's very fascinating about this, this was Ryan Johnson's way of going... Luke ain't going nowhere. X Wing's underwater. Right? But talk about taking garbage or turning it into gold. We won't get into it too much now because that's that's next week. But I it's amazing what JJ picked up from this movie and made it like it was all intended. Right? Like that is one plus one upside to a lot of this is that it does feel like while it wasn't planned as far as like them working together there are things that do work together despite ryan's efforts <laughs> well I, I mean we talked a lot about this as we did our picard season three review with you know terry metallis taking things that you actively hated mm -hmm. about a prior you know things in prior seasons and him turning it into just the absolute greatest gold that you could ask for. Um, and so that's, you know, right. this, this is where JJ goes, oh, you have a X-Wing underwater for me? Why? What a perfect gift. I know exactly what to do with it. <laughs> yep. Um, I think it's just, just a great shot of Daisy Ridley as, as Ray. I think that's the only reason I took this. <laughs> Um, looking for positives, right? Um, yeah, so Chewie and uh, well, Chewie breaks down the door and uh, basically beg Luke, uh, we need you. Of course, his, his response is, Where's Han? I, I do like this scene, do you? I, his. Because it's when you kind of realize like he's been cut off so cut off from the force that he doesn't even like know what happened to Han. Right. The way he asks, like, like, you know, like where's Han? I I do I do actually really like this scene with Chewie and and, and that. Right. Then we're reintroduced to Snoke. And here's our next character who was, in my view just by the visuals alone turned into a joke because he's gone from this dark like ghoulish zombie like vampiric looking thing to this like hugh hefner in space the I, gold that, robes yeah and even his visual appearance like he looks more like just an old man who's well, deformed but I I swear that his face is shaped different. There is different. They did change it. I mean, it's it's this. It's supposed to be the same, but they definitely updated it. You know, because yeah, it's it. It really does. Just it feels like old man who you should avoid at the park. <laughs> like that. That's 
Whereas yeah. before, it, 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 it some of it's the, the the mannerisms, the and I know it's still Andy Circus, but it's Andy Circus under the direction of a different director. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. I to the point that I have to wonder: is this still actually, in fact, the same physical entity? that we saw in the last movie. And you are completely frozen in the most hilarious pose right now. And I am completely screenshotting that. I mean, honestly, you could almost take this as a completely different entity than the one we saw in Force Awakens. I mean, this, I, this, I remember coming out of the movie theater and just being like, who the heck was that? That is not the same guy that we saw in that hollow projection. Like, what the heck is going on? Again, something that like was very frustrating, but might actually have you know some merit to it that this might actually not be the very same snoke that is right. you know something that now becomes a, a possibility uh later so i mean there's also a lot going on here in terms of like why characters are doing certain things um obviously he's being a manipulator so but none of that none of that diminishes the WTF of the wardrobe slash mannerism choice for this, for this movie. Well, because it signals to the audience, don't take this guy seriously, in my mind. Just like Hux. Um, there's this whole thing going on. I don't know how much I want to get into it, but I do think there's this, in today's culture, um, it does seem like there's this, especially of people of a certain um, political persuasion in entertainment, to not take evil seriously. Like it's very much portrayed as like silly billies, just like ha ha ha, right? You make fun of them, right? Oh, they're, so, like, they're so stupid, right? There's no true menace, right? And it's like you can't have true heroism without true evil you know well we're gonna diminish all our heroes so <laughs> why bother having any evil for them to face well exactly uh let's see yeah so the, this the, the, is the, oh when he walks around i i i forgot how ridiculous it looked yeah it so really this is the, this is the scene where we get the take that ridiculous thing off and just a child in a mask. And again, this just feels like, isn't that Star Wars stuff silly? Well, that's so one of the things I know we keep bringing up like our mysterious mutual friend, Brian Baugh, <laughs> but he is also a big Star Wars fan. And so some like a lot of the conversations I've had about these movies, like for both Josh and I have involved him. And one of his biggest complaints for this whole movie was like, where were all the cool aliens? Where's all the cool and 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 watching through this time, like I, I finally like I really understood what he meant. Like, because even like you already had this weird alien-ish, like you said, like almost vampiric kind of presence in Snoke. And it's like, this is like, no, 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 no. He's just a weird, creepy dude in, in a robe. Like the cool stuff you already had established, they were like, no, 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 we got to do away with that. Nor are we going to add anything much. Like even, even in later scenes where you'd expect there to be lots of crazy different things. Like look at Maz Kanata's palace in Force Awakens. And you're just like, that feels Star Wars. And you got none of that 
that that comes through here. Like it just it like oh, we don't need those as long as I've got like just just people looking things to, to move around to do my to do my screenplay with. Like this really does feel the further and further I went into it in this viewing, like this is a movie that belonged somewhere else and not in Star Wars. Well, and that anyway. movie might have even been pretty good. But <laughs> well, like, I think we said last time we might have said like visuals and cool characters are a big component of Star Wars, but it's part of its success. And this movie basically killed Star Wars merchandising. Like it did. It's still it's still trying to recover from the damage this movie did because there was nothing really fun to make from it. I mean, the heroes are largely largely wear the same outfits, right? Um, there was nothing new to to mine. Um, so there was nothing to get excited about, nothing to buy that was like fresh and exciting. So yeah, it, it, and that's and that's all whether you like it or not. That is part of what has made Star Wars the success that it is. Right. Yeah, it all matters. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, yeah, we got the helmet smashing scene. Um, what's there to say? Which, again, I love that, of course, the intent was the, you know, that oh this would have been swept up and thrown away thrown in the garbage only to be plucked out by our returning director later I, again the, the stuff that of course it was intended to be like see it's gone you can't have it yeah it a, good, a, a good writer literal, always finds a way picking up the pieces yep well, it, 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 his scar too, like. Oh, they, they adjusted his scar. Yeah. Right, and and it was like all these things where it was like, okay, fine, I'm going to pick up your movie, but oh, but I'm going to move his scar over here. Oh, but I'm also going to do this. Oh, I'm going to do that because I don't like. Then don't make the second movie in a series if you're going to just change all this stuff without right. an in-universe explanation for it that makes sense within the universe of it. So here's where we get, you know, like you said earlier, how Ray is saying, we need the Jedi Order back when he looks Skywalker. Um, as the line where he's like, what do you think I'm going to come out with my laser sword and cut face down the whole First Order? You know, it's kind of making fun of the audience. Like, oh, you want this fun, action-packed movie where Luke Skywalker is Luke Skywalker? <laughs> you know? And which would be fine... If we actually got that at the end, we get we get close to this, it. Right. This is the the this is where I see that kind of what I call that cinema file point of view, where they they see movies as like these like inter like these moving parts that just kind of go together certain ways and and so therefore when we put them together in a different way ooh that's interesting because the end of this in a way i think is trying to kind of deliver a little bit on that but it doesn't really and so i again it might be the type of thing in another movie where these types of things haven't been established what they look like. It might have worked, but it's tough because, yeah. And, and again, yeah, the, 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 the calling it of a laser sword. I know that that exists in the universe, but for Luke Skywalker to be using the term, that's the part that really... You know. Oh, and you know what I have to say to that? <laughs> oh, you remind me. me. I'm so I'm so thirsty. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
go. <laughs> really? The way it's the way that whatever that cow thing that turns and looks at Daisy Ridley like, yep. <laughs> yeah, so what's there to say I... about this? What's there to say? I mean, it's just... Well, like you said, it's just added on to the laundry list of things that we didn't take seriously. Which, again, this is where I kind of start to realize this as, I, as I'm watching these things pile up. And I'm thinking about it more critically. I realize this is exactly Ryan Johnson's sensibilities in his Knives Out and Glass Onion movies. But the difference is he is taking on the mystery genre, not Sherlock Holmes specifically or Hercule Poirot specifically. He's taking on the genre. So he's offering up his own new detective. And so it's much, you know, so his sensibilities being a little bit off kilter, it's okay because it's his own character he is doing this to. He is not taking a character that has been beloved and understood in a certain regard and being like, well, here, I'm going to do these zany things with them. It's his own, you know, it's his, it's his own character. And so it's, as I watched this more and more, I was like, this is, this is particularly Glass Onion, like, but in space using Star Wars characters. <laughs> that was like my big revelation watching this is like, this is just a Ryan Johnson movie. Like, it's not Star Wars. It's just Ryan Johnson with like, the corpse of Star Wars having its skin stretched over. The, the, um, it just, he wasn't interested in making a Star Wars movie. And I, there are people that praised him for this. What a brilliant way to make a Star Wars movie, to not make a Star Wars movie. I, I think I, I started to get at the pre-culture war. Because again, you talked about it was, there was several months before it became the battlefield it was. And I think the people that were like, oh, I like this, were looking at it just like any other film. Like, oh, look at that. The way it subverts my expectations. That doesn't belong here. Well, the problem is, I don't know that... I know this probably doesn't apply to everyone, but it seemed like there wasn't people like loving and calling it a masterpiece until there was the blowback. When it, it became like, oh, you, those people hate it? Oh, then I'm going to love it, right? This became both reactionary. Like, oh, they love it, or I'm going to hate it. Right. I knew I knew people who enjoyed it, but I didn't know right. anyone coming out of the theater that was like the greatest Star Wars yet type of type of level. It was just, yeah, I enjoyed it. Like, like they had, they had no problem with it. They were just excited for the next movie. So. It, it, it did take time for it to become the, the battlefield that it is. Yeah. So then Ray, so she hears some voices and um, she's, it leads her to this tree. And this is where I, when I'm watching the movie the first time, I'm starting to get excited, right? Oh, oh yeah. I, I'm like, oh, the mysteries of the force. What are, what are, what are we going to learn? Right? Because it feels like the whole point of us being on this island is to learn something about, you know, the history of the Jedi um, and then we see which by the by the way did you did you notice that the uh description of this movie on Disney plus is like you know we learn the mysteries of the force and I'm like did you watch the same movie I did <laughs> like what mysteries of the force I thought that yeah. was very funny I, I caught yes. that after the movie was <laughs> over but yeah but here with these texts because these were in the trailer right it might have been and, Right, because you and I, I remember talking about like, oh my gosh, like ancient Jedi texts. Like, what what will we learn from this? And it's 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 not only do we not learn anything. I know this is jumping ahead of ourselves, but it's they're blown off as if completely unimportant. That's the worst part. Page so, turners, uh, they are not. And right. yeah, well, yeah, we'll get to that. 
So yeah, so but then Luke comes in and says to Ray, "Who are you? Why are you here?" And she answers one way, and he's like, "No, who are you?" Um, which again, if if you're looking at the context, of he's very suspicious of, you know, and he is suspicious, right? Like tying back into the the saber thing, like if he's looking at this as a some kind of ploy. The dark side, because we know from Rise that he he knows that Ray is a Palpatine. We don't know when he learns that, right? Right. Um, I'm assuming he doesn't know it yet, but I think there's a chance he learns it at some point during this movie. Um, but again, he may be suspecting. Well, yeah, he suspect. I think he right? suspects definitely. Well, and especially especially if he was always questioning, because we don't know how much Luke knew of Snoke. This is one of the things that's never really ironed out. Right. Did he have some kind of suspicion about Snoke? Snoke, right? And so it's like, okay, Snoke got to Palp... or Snoke got to, you know, to Ben. Well, did he have his own other apprentice elsewhere? Like, who... Like, yeah, who are you? Um... Because we also learn in Rise that, which completely retcons this movie, is that Luke was very involved in the texts to the point where he was adding stuff to them, where he was looking for Exegol. So maybe he had some kind of suspicion already that Palpatine was still out there. And so when Ray shows up, he's thinking, not necessarily she's a Palpatine, but is Palpatine involved in these machinations? Like- Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, luring me out because, and this does, this does go to play with because, you know, the first order is obsessed with killing Luke Skywalker because like, as soon as, if, if Luke Skywalker is dead, if the Jedi do not rise, then there is nothing to stop us. And really it, it's Palpatine, right? You know, it's, the Jedi Order needs to end completely before Palpatine can make his, you know, full return. And of course, Luke will be gone by the time Palpatine goes and reveals himself. Right. Um, so Ray responds, she says, um, something inside me has always been there. Now it's awake and I'm afraid. I don't know what it is or what to do with it. Now, on first glance, it's like, oh, she's talking about the Force. But she already knew she had the Force, the Force Awakens. So to me, she's talking about something else. Um, I think she's specifically talking about the darkness inside of her, right? That it's not just the Force. There's something else there. That's, that's my read of it. Right, and it makes sense because Kylo, trying to be of the dark, the light is constantly welling in him. And then, of course, Rey, being of the light, now the darkness is welling in her. Um, Now, of course, the thing that, again, I love that because clearly, you know, we're going to learn that she's got darker origins, but one's origins do not necessarily determine one's self. Right. And then Luke says, um, before he leaves, he says, I came to this island to die. It's time for the Jedi to end. Um, So we'll find out more what that means later on. Um, So (laughs) back at the fleet, Leia slaps Poe. Because this is the movie, for some reason, we have to completely tear down Poe Dameron for some reason. Like... He was a completely fine, admirable, book, admirable character in The Force Awakens, but now we're treating him like he's some kind of scumbag. And it's just, I know they manufacture some reason where it's like he's a hotshot who puts people's lives in danger, but it, it doesn't it doesn't read. It's it's like it's manufactured. Thing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's like to actually slap him. I mean. Like, I, I, it's just fun uh, fact. 
Josh, yeah. do you know if you went to like the D box theaters? You know, the ones like with the extra sensory, the ushers would actually come and slap the audience across the face just to make sure you got the point. <laughs> oh, I got the point. Uh, but yeah, again, this is just the total emasculation of all the male characters, like across the board Poe, Hux, Luke, Finn, and Kyle. I mean, it's just one after another. It, it, you can't help but not see it as. Agenda driven, you know. And then she's got this goofy thing. Where she's got a beacon that's going to um, tell Ray where they're at. It's just a lot of this stuff just feels so. There's not a smoother Star Wars way to do this, you know. I don't know. Well, I mean, given that the entire movie is going to break one of the biggest premises of Star Wars, which is if you can just get to hyperspace, you're you're gone, right? And I know that they like stuck in a reference in Rogue One somewhere, <laughs> but like it, I. Well, so much of this, yeah, between, I mean, you're talking about beacons and light speed tracking and officer demotions. It feels like it's these are it's a Star Trek language. Like, and then like, and losing fuel. Like, these are Star Trek things. This is not something that happens in Star Wars. It, it, like, Star Wars is definitely more fanta space fantasy, not, you know, science fiction. And it's, there's, there's a few too many, like, you know, nuts and bolts sci fi things. Well, but it, the thing, though, is, is, it would be one thing if they felt like they were there for the nuts and bolts. It, it's like, it's literally like writing, oh, wait a minute. The fleet's in some random thing with something. They won't know how to, oh, I know. It's, she's got a beacon. Like, it it feels, well, wait a minute. Why, why would we be having this police chase, like, you know, down the freeway? you know, of, uh, of space. Why would this be having, oh, 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 well, there's fuel. All of us, like it, it, everything feels like a contrivance for the because, next contrivance. Because Ryan is interested in, in just his ideas. The other stuff, he's just like putting band-aids on it. Elder, else there'll be a beacon. Right. Like, it's just, you know, you can tell it's not important to him. It's the other stuff's important. Right. Then we get the scene where uh, they attacked the resistance. Kylo is going to shoot the ship. He decides not to because he feels since it's Leia, and the, but then the other TIE fighter shoot it anyway. She's blown into space. Um, I know we disagree on this. I actually really like this. Scene. Oh, I, I felt I felt better about it this time. Did you okay. watching it? Yeah, because I've always wanted to see Leia like use the Force, and I think she does it in a really cool way, and. You know, so I, I really don't have a problem with this. I don't let people tear it apart, I, the whole Mary Poppins thing. I, but I honestly, I think my biggest issue with it is, is you've gone and taken one of the best characters that you've got and you sideline her for most of the movie in order to drive the other contrivances. And then when you know it, you wasted it because this was the last movie we got with her, like physically, you know, with Carrie Fisher, like, I think that's my biggest issue with it now is mm -hmm. it just, it feels like just how much she is sidelined in this movie. Um, need, and I think ultimately needlessly. So, but again, he had an idea of what he wanted and everything else didn't matter as long as he got his idea. Can I offer a, a different theory? All right. Is this a bigger thing than what we're thinking? Is this Disney not wanting to bank on their billion dollar franchise on an actress who has not acted in years, right? And who has a history of personal problems. So did they intentionally make sure that she was sidelined because they put a character in her, in her place who was basically the same type as her, which I'll get into later, which is one of my beasts of the movie. Was this all just because of something like that? Like 
bigger world, real world politic type stuff, like studio type. I mean, who knows? Well, you know, because look, Harrison Ford, he's a bankable star, so he got to drive Force Awakens. He was in, you know, he was the star of that movie. But Carrie Fisher, we can't trust a movie with Carrie Fisher, right? If you're Disney, so that's just my, you know, conspiracy hat thinking. So we're back on the island, Ray's sleeping outside Luke's um, hut, and I, I almost wish, because I think them starting you know, right after the last movie was a caused problems. I almost wish they kind of started maybe even here, where you see Ray, you know, sleeping outside his hut. You could maybe show that she still has the lightsaber, and you would infer, oh, Luke rejected it, and she's waiting on him you know i think they could have found right. a creative way to avoid doing the right after you know um but anyway so luke sneaks sneaks aboard the falcon and this is you know really our only scene of him you know in our our classic vehicle which feels so after watching Picard season three and the efforts gone to, to, you know, I, I even saw there was a meme posted. I've seen, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That, right. The top one says what star Wars fans wanted. And it uh -huh. shows, you know, all of them older in the cockpit of the Falcon. It's like what star Trek fans got. And it's just, <laughs> of course the screenshot of yeah. the entire crew there on the enterprise D bridge. And a um, ship that even technically didn't exist anymore. <laughs> right. I, I, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, R2 awakens. And uh, Luke says, you know, I wish you could make you understand, but I'm not coming back. And then R2 plays, you know, the classic Leia hologram. And it's after this that Luke does have a, a slight change of heart. So, like, I know we talked about last time, like, R2 not being prevalent in the movies, but he's given an important moment in each one. I think you could see this as, like, this is sort of a turning point for Luke. It's not the ultimate turning point that we want, but it is, after this, he does go to Ray and say, I'm going to give you three lessons. Um, I'll teach you ways of the Jedi and why they need to end, unfortunately. But um, it, it is it has changed course a little bit. Um, so... Here we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, this is Finn is trying to sneak away. So he, not out of cowardice, he wants to go connect with Ray so that you know she knows where they're at, etc. <sighs> it's just again, it's just the way these scenes are done. She's got to freaking stun him like and he's like. He flies through the air like a, like a clown, and this is not the only time this happens to a character in the movie. You know, it's and it's at first she's like idolizing him, right? Like she's like, "Oh, you're Finn," blah blah blah. But even after she learns the truth about him, like, "Oh, he wasn't trying to escape," her tone doesn't change. She doesn't go back to revering him. She treats him like a dummy for the entire movie. You know. Yeah, I. The other thing too is, is I hate how stupid his dialogue is here. Mm -hmm. Like, the thing is, is we've watched him. You know, he has his moments in the in the Force Awakens, right, where he's kind of like, it's like, oh yeah, I'm a I'm a big deal in the Resistance and everything, right? But we watch him grow through that to a very serious, confident. Well, he's, person he's at the end. yeah, it's balanced, right? Right. So, I mean, to the point that he picks up a lightsaber to take on, you know, yes, basically, basically essentially a freaking Sith apprentice. And to then immediately now we're back to just like, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this awkward uh, thing. Uh, and I, I, man, I, I felt so bad for John Boyega, mm -hmm. what, like watching that, where it's just, this this is a painful scene. 
uh, there's there's no two ways around it. It is awkward, uh, like I said, because of Poe, or I'm sorry, because of Finn's dialogue, like his side of it. And then, um, it, <sighs> Ryan Johnson does Rose zero favors in writing her character for this. That's, that's not what Which, he thinks he's doing, uh, though, right? Oh, I, oh, I, I'm aware of that. Uh, and it sucks because one of the things I remember, Josh, when before the movie came out, and you kind of they were like, "Oh, what are the characters?" Is it Rose take Tycho, uh, and she's like a like a mechanic or something. And you're like, "Hey, that's awesome! That's someone we've never seen really in Star Wars." The kind of mechanic side of it, which of course you know, Battlestar having, Galactica. Uh, having shade, yeah, you know, she's we got to see it. Right. Right, yeah. ex exactly. Right, the you know the chief and Callie and that and the and the kind of the pit crew, like awesome. They're going to kind of bring them into it. They're not just going to be random extras that are fueling up the X rings and then walking away. And so, I think one of the things that like it extra hurts was how excited that we were for the possibilities of this character, and then to realize that he just completely wastes. Uh, anything great that could have been done with this character, all in the name of no. well, okay. The thing, okay, the thing is with Star Wars from the beginning, and I, I hate that I hate this phrase with a passion, but they've always had strong female characters, right? Whatever that phrase means, but it's never it was never at the expense of the male characters. They stood on their own, just like the male characters did. But in this movie. Ryan's new characters like Rose, Holda, whatever, they can only be strong at the expense of denigrating the men, right? If the men have to be, uh, you know, ridiculed, emasculated for them to be uh, elevated. Rather than them holding on to their own, which exactly. they've always done, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So when people like push back, well, well Leia was always like yes, Leia was always a, a strong character, but the point was is that the other characters stood with her. It was not, you know, they didn't have to ridicule Han and Luke to make Leia strong. Um well the thing the fun thing too is is any time that she had, you know, like she's kind of mocking their rescue and stuff mm -hmm. like that, right? It it was you were able to have like the humor without it actually being like, I'm going to put you in your place because the other thing cool. too, is that they all kind of like, this is why Han and Leia were such an amazing, like, you know, relationship. Because Han gave it back to her. Right, right. Exactly. And I mean, that's also why you can imagine why it didn't necessarily last the, the, you know, the stress of everything that would come to happen. It, but yeah, it everyone stood on their own, even as they, you know, uh, kind of gave it to other characters. It was given and taken. It all worked together. Well, and that creates like sexual tension, which is the core of all great, you know, uh, cinematic romances, right? Um, but not not in these movies. Um. God, this I know. I it's <laughs> so talk about a waste of it, 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 it's just so they figure out, you know, they're being hyperspace tracked or whatever, blah blah blah. We gotta find someone who can break into this first order ship so they can shut off the thing. And uh, Poe's Poe's first thought is, "Oh, Maz." And again, I would ask, "How does he know Maz?" Um, again, it's only been how long since? Anyway, whatever. But instead of like them actually using Maz to do this, they just have her show up in a brief cameo and point them somewhere else. Like, why not actually use her? Right? You've got this character. Why? Like, why even have her in the movie? That's what well, it's I her being in this movie in this regard to me undermines the character from the 
previous film. Because well, yeah. the character in the previous film wouldn't have been like, oh, you're taking on the First Order? Like, oh, I'm, I, I'm in a trade dispute. You don't want to know <laughs> about it. Like, right. Yeah, because she's talking about good and evil and all kinds of stuff. And then, yeah, here she can't, she can't be bothered, you know. Yeah, it, it, it... It's like, why even have her appear? Like... Yeah, no, it was it, it really was uh, a waste. And the funny thing is, I always felt it was a waste. Yes. This was the first time I really realized what a betrayal of her character it was. Like she this this is not how she would react. This is not how Maz Kanata of The Force Awakens would react to this situation. Yeah. Good point. Um I'm trying to remember. Oh, is this when she first sees Kylo? I think this is what this is. It is. Okay. I was I was gonna ask at first, oh, our second uh like just nice Daisy Ridley shot, but then I realized exactly where this is in the film. Like, no, she's <laughs> realizing that she's she's seeing Kylo. Yeah, I think I have um, some things out of whack in my notes in the screenshots, so just bear with me. Um, let's see where I'm at. Okay, you know, okay, okay, now I'll see where I'm at. Okay, um, so yeah, so this is the scene where they first see each other, and Kylo says, you're not doing this, the effort would kill you. So to me, this is all setting up why Luke dies at the end, Right. Like this kind of power, this force projection, but right. zaps all, all your strength. But so there's something else for, for her to be doing or not do she's not doing it, obviously. For them to be experiencing it, someone else is behind it, essentially. Um so Luke takes Ray up to this the top of the island, and there's this cave. So as she's like reaching out to the force, um She's, she says she feels life, death, and all those other things, right? And um, Luke says, uh, balance, powerful light, powerful darkness. Uh, th this is like a misconception of what balance of the force means. According to George Lucas, balance of the force does not mean equal light, equal dark. It's the light is dominant and winning. It means that the dark is like basically either all but eradicated. Any kind of any darkness throws the force out of balance. But it, but Ryan seems to be saying that oh, if you've got both, that's balance. And that is that's not the case. Just wanted to point that out. Um, also, Luke says something to the effect of like. It's like, what does he say? Is hubris for the Jedi to think that if they die, the Force is in danger or something to that effect? I understand some of what he's, I think what he's trying to say is that the Force is bigger than all of that. Yes, that if the Jedi die, that doesn't mean that the Force goes away. But if it does feel like Ryan is doing a, definitely trying to like undermine the idea of being a Jedi and all that. Um, even though by the end, he, you know, he, he says, oh, just kidding. It just, the, t the overall tone is one of, um, isn't all this terrible? Or isn't all this stupid? Anyway, <laughs> so um, th th here, here's some good stuff, though. So, Ray, you know, doing her meditation and says, um, she starts seeing like a, this dark side cave or hole or something on the island. And she says, it's calling me. And um, uh, Luke says, you went straight to the dark. Ray says, that place was trying to show me something. Um, and then Luke says, or Ray says, uh, just talking about Luke, like, I didn't see you like in the force. You closed yourself off. 
He says, I've seen this kind of raw strength once before. It didn't scare me then. It scares me now. Um, talking about Kylo. Um, but so this is this is a pretty important scene as far as in the context of the sequel trilogy as a whole, where Ray instantly, when she senses the dark side, goes to it, right? She feels um that she has there's answers there for her. And you know, again, if we're we know that this even if this was not the intention of the movies as a whole. We're looking at it, we're just looking at it as we're trying our best looking at these as just movies, looking at the context. And when you look at all this, this does to me um, provide a very strong through line of Ray and her journey and uh, who she is. Right? Because um, I think the spine of this movie, which is the Ray stuff. Kylo stuff is the strongest part of it. And it's the stuff that matters. Um, the sequel to the trilogy as a whole. Well, and it, it also, it pushes back against the, well, nothing was planned there. The whole thing may not have been completely sketched out and inked to the end but it's not like Rise of Skywalker is just going to pull things out of thin air. Well, exactly. There's, because there are was... there are things here that have been seeding this. And it makes sense because Kylo is the dark side pulled to the light. Right. You know, right? But he came from the light. Right, Laura Santeca says, "Like you are not of the dark side, right?" So really, he's of the light, trying to be of the dark. Is really his bloodline is the light. Go, and he wants the dark. Her bloodline is of the dark, and she wants the light. But she's of right. course drawn to what she is. The same way Kylo is constantly drawn to the light. Like I feel it again. The draw, the pull to the light. So it, it's. Not like this is a complicated like thing that got put together later. Like all of the elements are there, even though they aren't thrown at you, they are there. And in this case, it's getting even more deeply explored and kind of called out. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, Force Awakens, we had lots of hints about dark side. This movie, we're getting very blatant dark side stuff. So I mean. Yeah, I, I don't think you can say, you know, that Palpatine comes out of nowhere. In one sense, he does. In, in a sense, he does, yes. But when you look at all the context, um, there's really only one way it can go. Um, one way or another. Oh, I kind of... <laughs> I wasn't going through our, our slides during all that. Okay. So then we get to this scene. Um, I, I just like this this moment of her just, you know, feeling the rain because it's, it's all new to her still, right? Um, so points for that. Um, but then they ha have their, um, their next uh, force projection encounter. Um, I know there's a lot of back and forth with her, you know, saying, you know, you're terrible for killing Hod, et cetera. But also the th thing about this scene is that he has, he's left with rain on his hands. And this is important. We'll get into it later, but um, this is more than just like illusion or projection. They are bridging this gap, right? He ends up with rain on his hands. So there's, there's definitely a physicality to this which we will get into later. So we're now we're at the biggest chunk of the movie that's really hard to get through is um, Canto Bite, which to me is just Ryan Johnson raging at rich people. And it's it's Hollywood always does this. They'll always have these things about 
horrible rich people, but it's only people who are maybe slightly more richer than they are. Like Hollywood is one of the richest places on the planet, but they're always somehow more virtuous because they're griping about other rich. It's just it rings so hollow and pathetic to me. Um, especially coming from Disney, <laughs> <laughs> one of the richest corporations on the planet. It's like, please. Anyway, <clears throat> um, of course, Finn is totally fascinated by this place, thinks it's cool. And of course, Rose has to put him in his place, you know, um, and show him that in the underbelly that, you know, they're abusing these horses and they've got child slaves. It's just, and there's this line where, <laughs> Um, it's so, it's like you can have a point of view. That's fine, but can you express it intelligently? You know, because Rose says only one thing can make you this rich, and Finn says war. It's like <laughs> really, like there hasn't been war since Return of the Jedi. So how they get so rich in the thirty years between then and now? Like this war just started. It's so dumb. Um, and then this is the probably the stupidest line in all Star Wars, in my opinion. <laughs> and when Rose says, I wish I could put my fist to this lousy, beautiful town. Someone wrote that scene. Someone wrote that. <laughs> and then filmed it. Are you are you sure? Are you sure it wasn't just the uh an AI bot? Early, early on, I mean, oh, if AI can time travel, maybe. But yeah, someone wrote that, filmed it, edited it, and put it in a billion dollar movie. I oh, and and I'm sure someone thinks it's absolute poetry. Moving on. <laughs> Um, oh, well, right after that, we get this is probably my favorite scene in the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, we're just gonna enjoy the scenery for a moment. This beautiful scenery of <laughs> the lovely Daisy Ridley practicing with her lightsaber. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love this scene until the very end. Well, of course, because Ryan Johnson has to do what he does. But I'm going to enjoy it for the, for the moment. There's just... This, the cinematography is just stunning. <laughs> um, yeah, just uh, good stuff. But, yeah. but then, yeah, she cuts the rock and yuck yucks and sue. Okay, so back at it. This is when Luke gets his gives his whole kind of spiel on why um, why he's he's so angry and upset. He says, "Now that they're extinct, the Jedi are romanticized, deified. The legacy of the Jedi is failure." Um, and it's like it's hard it's hard to know what to do with these lines because. So your first is there's some truth, obviously. Um, and also it's like how much again so much of this movie is how much of it is the characters being wrong, you know, intentionally, or how much of it is Ryan Johnson putting his two cents in the characters' mouths, you know? Right. And trying um, to sort through this. Yeah. So it's hard to even discuss. I don't know if it's even worth discussing, but um, one thing of note, um, because one thing that, you know, we're talking about the Palpatine and the dark side stuff with Ray, um, I would say one of the, because Palpatine is never mentioned in the movies until he shows up, but actually he is, he's mentioned in this scene as, uh, Darth Sidious, which is the alter ego that Palpatine hid behind. Like he is hiding right now, 
So, I mean, that's something good you can draw from this, I think. Um, oh, I remember the first time we were theaters mm -hmm. and I heard just hearing the name Darth well, Sidious. And you're just like, yes! Well, yeah, I get point, I, get, I do give points for them saying Darth Sidious. That is a prequel thing. It seems like I think anyone else would have said this Palpatine, right? So I do give points for that. But then he throws Obi-Wan under the bus. <laughs> when he says a Jedi was responsible for creating Darth Vader. It's like, really? Obi-Wan? Anyway. Um, Unless he means Mace Windu by not giving him the uh, rank of uh, master yeah. and the seat on the council. Uh, uh, and then he says, um, in my hubris, I thought I could train him. Talking about Ben. Like, why is that hubris? You're a Jedi master thinking you can train your nephew. That's hubris? Like, well, again, I, I take that as I, I take a decent portion of this as when you screw up something, whether it's your fault or not, when something goes south, mm -hmm. I think it's a very natural <clears throat> instinct to be like, like, like how stupid was I to think that this was going to work? Like you kind of just retroactively beat yourself up about it so i can under i can understand it i can understand this part of it and him feeling this way now i would have written it differently expressed it differently but i can at least understand where he's coming from in, in, in terms of the sentiment well, of well again of it's it comes down to it's what makes it hard to discuss because it's how much of it is like these characters going through these emotions, or how much of it is Ryan Johnson spewing his his BS through the characters? That's what makes it very hard to analyze and discuss, right? Because you can't take it at face value. And then we get our um, our first flashback in the movie, Ever. and in all of Star Wars, yes, um, Force Awakens. It was done very creatively as a force vision. But here it's just, no, we're going to give you a flashback. This is the first of three that are different takes on the same event. And to me, if you're going to break Star Wars tradition, you better have a very good reason. And I don't know that this is a good enough reason because this whole event... Just it feels so paper thin to me. Like for this to be the moment that kind of changes everything, I think it needed to have a little bit more meat to it. But then, then like I went to my nephew in the middle of the night and thought about killing him, and then didn't. And then there was some center stick. Like it feels so just like first draft. Like I'll put this here, and I'll come back, and I'll plug in something really cool. Um. Right, I'll develop this. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll grow it into something. Because if you have a good enough reason, I, I can let it slide. But I don't think this is a good enough, like, you know, especially for the movie to hinge on this. Um, because imagine if there's so many different ways you could have handled this. Because would have been interesting if, like, you know, Luke forms the Jedi Order. But then like a schism forms, like maybe different points of view of how to bring back the Jedi because you have the prequel way, then you have Luke's way, which was like different, divorced from the Jedi code. So what if some kind of schism formed and that was the cause of like this conflict, you know, and like that could have ultimately led, you know, led to violence instead of this just misunderstanding, you know. I just think this could have been so much more interesting than what it turned out to be. I feel like I, I remember, I think at, at some point someone talking about this film said, this is like a reference to something else. This like three different points of view on the same thing or something. I, I just have a memory in my mind at some point of someone just drooling over like oh this is this is a well, reference to blah 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 or Rash something Rashomon, like, right sure <laughs> i 
I don't whatever, know like a, whatever. Is that a Pokemon? I have no idea no. what the heck that is. Yeah, there's like a movie that's like called Rashomon. It's about like, because Star Trek did a, did, a, did a whole take on it too in an episode of Next Generation. Like it's, it's sort of an whatever, alien. whatever it is. Yeah. I just had this memory of someone talking about like, oh, this is a thing. Right. But again, I just think it could be I've been handled a little bit better. Anyway. So, yeah. So Kylo says, or Luke says, um, he vanished with a handful of my students and slaughtered the rest. And he, he says, I failed because I was Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master, a legend. Uh, so this whole thing i mean what is there to say you know i got nothing just it's dumb they write to the town even 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 my 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 roommate who likes this movie will be like this is dumb oh and i think <laughs> i skipped over i completely skipped over like the, the worst character that's um did I skip over it? Yeah, Benicio Del Toro. And it was ridiculous. Like the, the whole... <laughs> it just... <sighs> God. Well, here's... Again, if it had been like this weird alien... But like every, every everything is like the most boring iteration possible. Like, you know what it is? It's like Ryan Johnson looked at Jabba the Hutt and said, no, I'll make him a fat man. As opposed to George Lucas, it's like, I got a fat man. No, no, no. I'm going to make him a giant slug. It, <laughs> right. it, it, you know what I mean? Like, everything is the most boring. Like, there's a couple little aliens in Canto Bite. Obviously, like, the little guy that puts all the coins in, uh, in BB-8. Um, but, like, you look at that and you're just like, it just looks like something out of the Great Gatsby. It, it, it doesn't look like if yeah. you freeze frame that you'd you'd have to yeah. search for something that was truly alien, and it, you know, right. I mean, if I'm forced to say something positive, I like the design of the horses, but that's about it. Yeah, I find them weird, just boring. This whole scene though feels like a Harry Potter scene. That's the vibe I get. That that's actually pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then let's see what. I can't remember what the next. Okay, we're gonna hit ourselves. Um, but like they get to the end of this, you know, they're they're chased and whatever, and then we get the second dumbest line of the movie, which is tied into the first, <laughs> where Finn says, "It was worth it." To tear up that town, make him hurt. I just, oh my god. Anyway, um, I just so Luke does this thing, gets his powers back, and then we get our second flashback from Kylo's point of view. Um. It looks like a crazed person. Right? This, <laughs> just, just, there's a great meme about this, which I won't repeat. Um, but um, yeah, and this is where we get the famous line, let the past die, kill it if you have to. When Kyle was talking to Ray. Um, so right after, right after this, um, she goes to the dark side cave. And um, she sees, first of all, I just want to say, she looks, she looks amazing here. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> one of my favorite shots of her. Um, anyway, so she sees all these, rec you know, uh, echoes of herself. In my mind, and I even thought this at the time, is that this was symbolizing cloning. That to me, this is saying that she comes from basically cloning experiments that we find out later, right? Hmm. Do you see something different? 
I what I I mostly saw was a complete waste to do something really truly awesome well, and just well, have this weird yes snapping thing. I did catch this time. She says something along the lines of like it wasn't an infinite. Okay, she it says was leading me somewhere. This couldn't go on forever. I knew it was leading somewhere. At the end of it, it would show me what I came to see. Yeah. So. I, I, again, the theme of this movie is the excitement to see something and being presented with nothing. Well, exactly. I mean, <laughs> yes, I'm just trying to make the most of this. Um, but when I when I did see it, I did think, oh, is, is, this, is there a cloning involved? You know, and of course, we find out there is. Um, I know that wasn't necessarily his attention, but um, and then so she, she says the lines, you know, like I said, and she says, let me see them, my parents. Now, we first see two shadows behind the glass, the, the wall or whatever. And they coalesce into one. Mm. So to me, this is like, you know, yeah, she had two parents. But, you know, ultimately, there's one person responsible. But then she sees herself when she wipes away the glass. And to me, this is sort of like Luke's Dagobah cave experience where when he kills Vader, he sees himself. Right. So like, to me, she's seeing herself in the, the way I interpret it now, the shadow that was representing Palpatine, whereas Luke saw his face in the specter that was Darth Vader. Right. right. And we'll, and we will have a vision of, you know, dark side Ray, of course, you know, right. <clears throat> so, so again, I think these things all play into where ultimately the story goes. Um, Um, then we have uh, another force projection scene, but this time they actually touch hands, physically touch hands. Ray obviously feels it, so um, this isn't just a mind thing, right? Um, so once Luke gets his powers back, he I guess he instantly senses there's something going on, and he, and he rushes over, destroys the hut. Um, and then we get this, this, the stupid duel, I guess, because it, it bothers me because it's like, I would have been fine if they had a full on lightsaber fight here. Like not to the death, obviously, but like, I feel like this is another type Ryan just going, Oh, looks like a fight with a weather vane. You know, like he's still not going to fight with a lightsaber. But Ray eventually pulls her lightsaber, but then um, uh, Luke still is like, this is what he says, this is not going to go the way you think. You know, he still refuses to... Um, um, well, he, I think he gives his a more elaborate his side of the story of the, the flashback. We had our third version where he says, like, he thought about it, then stopped, and then Kylo happened to wake up when he saw the saber ignited. Um, and then we get our only saber clash in the entire movie, which is a flashback. Um, she offers him the saber again, and it's like, at this point in a movie, like, the second time is usually when, like, they would, like, okay, this time I take it, and it's just like, no, still not taking it. <laughs> and Ray leaves, and then Luke. <laughs> and of course, the first time I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, he's going to the tree because he's going to get some some knowledge to help. He's actually going to do something crazy, but no, he's going to to burn it down, right? And then Yoda shows up. Which I always forget the Yoda's even in this movie. It just feels like, oh yeah, Yoda. Um, so Luke says, this has second. He's okay. He's not going to burn it down, right? Then Yoda does, and then Luke gets mad that he did. Like I don't understand the logic of this scene. Can you? Do you have anything you can offer? I. I think. 
And maybe I'm just being too generous. Generous. No, it's fine. Maybe I'm being too. It, I mean, I, I just. I. I think it shows how that Luke's mind is clouded about this. Mm-hmm. Like he says, he's saying one thing, like, "Oh, the Jedi need to end and everything," but it. I think. Yoda is essentially drawing, getting him to realize you don't mean it. You you say this, but you know deep down this is not what you want. Um, kind of thing that I I feel like this is what the the intent of this is supposed to to try and be that it's like you don't actually want to jo- to destroy the text because it's kind of like. They say that if you can't decide between two things, like flip a coin, and in that moment, you'll realize what it is, the side that you hope it will go towards. Mm-hmm. It, it, essentially, that kind of thing. I I do like... I don't necessarily like the expense of everything that's been done in order to make this point, but I do like Yoda's... Like, we pass... Passing on our failures as well. Like, if you... If you don't pass on to your children an understanding of how you failed, they will make the same mistakes. And that's something I feel very personally because there are there are essentially like like stories of like my parents when they were younger, like they, they, you know, they made like mistakes or things happened in their life that were more complicated than I was ever led to believe growing up. So then I unfortunately grew up with a simplified view of how I thought the world kind of worked. And then I end up falling into and making a lot of those same mistakes, all because my parents essentially, as a lot of parents do, are just like, well, we can't let our children know that we aren't perfect. Otherwise, it's like it'll give them permission to go and make those mistakes. What they don't realize is without passing on the knowledge of that failure, we just will make the same mistake. And so I feel like this is. I know that I'm jumping way, way ahead here, but I feel like the one gift of this scene here is the knowledge of why Ray becoming the last Jedi to be the one to restore whatever a Jedi order looks like, why she will not fail because finally Luke is passing on the knowledge of that failure failure to her. She will not make the same mistake. Now I know that there's a ton of messy bits behind it, but again, we're going through this to mine for the good things. And so even though it's messy how we got here, I do love this lesson. And so, and it's a very Yoda thing to say. And now I have gone back and forth on the scene, I will fully admit. Because it's like the first time, I think the first time I was just like, oh my gosh, thank goodness Yoda. And they haven't done anything. No one's coming in and being like stupid Yoda or anything. Like he's just Yoda, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the first time I was like, oh, thank goodness there's Yoda. Then the second time, I I think I was like kind of angry. I was like, how dare you drag Yoda into this? (laughs) But I I think this third time, I I think I I, I, kind of got what I think was the intent and i then that think the type of thing that can be mined for something more um and so because one of the things i don't want is for them to bring ray back establish a jedi order just to have it like all fail again because no one has the smarts to figure out what it looks like and to make it interesting without tearing it apart and having that be the drama mm-hmm. so my hope is like build off of this. Ray will not make the same mistakes as Luke. Her Jedi Order will succeed. Okay, I'm I'm down with most of that. I guess. Um, no, it's well well said. I mean, um, the one thing I did like from this scene is. 
when Yoda says that library contained nothing that Ray does not already possess. The first time I watched it, I did not catch that she saved the books. I like even the second or third time. Like someone had someone tell me, like, oh no, the books are there. I, had, I told you. <laughs> was it you? Yeah, I because I was like, yeah, the books are in the thing. You're like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, she closes the door. You see, a drawer. You see the books, and you were in. You just yeah. That I long, caught it the first time. That did go a long way to like, you know, talking me off the ledge. Um, <laughs> because I mean, it just seemed par for the course that Ryan would have blown those up too, right? Um, but that allowed a great opening for JJ to do something awesome. So, <clears throat> um, moving on, this is where the scene, again, just feels just like more Ryan throwing out his own ideas about stuff. It just, the whole good guys, bad guys, the same thing, you know, they're both um, funded by the same people, essentially, whatever. Um Yeah, just you have anything that I, I, had, I, I didn't. I didn't take it. I didn't take it that way so much uh -huh. as it was the just. What's well, just war profiteering? Sell to them. Sell to them. Everyone gets rich. You know. To me, I, now I still don't. I I hate it being in here because it just feels like they're like, see, in, in U.S. and in military industrial complex, right? Well, that's my point. That's my right, point. Right. right. I, so I don't necessarily take it as like, oh, the good guys, the bad guys are all funded by the same people. It's just that this is, you know, weapons of war. Like they're they're selling to you. They're selling to you. They're, you know, um, it, it feels empty. Like all of this stuff feels empty and hollow. Like it's not relating back to what's happening with the first order, really. It just feels like an excuse to be like, Here's my real world political view. Well, it's, so. it's the goes with the constant undermining of the good versus evil that Star Wars is founded on. Because so we've had the completely undermining of the evil, the bad guys, of, of heroics, and then we get this scene, and it's just like, why? What do we? Why should I even care? Why? Why should I watch this movie? Right? It's just like I don't know. It's either Ryan doesn't understand Star Wars, or he, or he understands it perfectly, and and can't stand it. I feel like it's one of the two. <laughs> um, and here we have Poe is just trying to find out what's going on. Like, please tell us we have a plan. And Holdo just refuses for some reason to tell him or anyone anything. Like, I don't and, know. And the plan doesn't necessitate it. Exactly. That's the thing. And this, uh, this, this dynamic has started so many fights in my house because I'm, I, I am with you. Why the hell does she just not tell him that there even is a plan? Like there is a plan, but I can't tell you what it is. Like, no, it, nothing. And I, the, I'm constantly told it's like, well, he doesn't need to know, and it's like, I, I, I sometimes I, it, it's almost like I'm back, and it's season, it's episode two of Picard, and we're having an argument about how the military is supposed to function, and it's like th this is not the real world, like this, this is this resistance doesn't operate like, well, oh, well, you're a cardinal and the whole thing. I know that there is ranks, but this is the only time that we've ever had this, like, I'm pulling rank, I'm demoting you. Like, this is not how this works or has ever worked in the rebellion or in the resistance. This is just pulled out of nowhere, I, I feel. Like, this is a military thing, and this is not where we're at. It 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 feel it's utterly contrived. It feels like you know those sitcoms where it's like if someone would just say something, <laughs> it, the right. entire situation would disappear, but yes. then you wouldn't have a half hour of hilarity. It, it right. feels like the exact same thing where it's just like without she doesn't say anything. Because... Yeah, I know without the hilarity, <laughs> right. she doesn't say anything because his plot is only contrived by her not saying anything. That's right. it. That's the only, 
and they're going to try and turn this into like a, you know, his moment of like, you know, later of, oh, someone's doing something. There's a reason. So I'm going to believe in the reason, even though I don't know what it is. And it, it it's like, I get what you're trying to do, but it, it's, it's a hollow, shallow, you know, uh, epiphany moment and everything that you have sacrificed and destroyed to tr- achieve it. It's, it's just a waste. Well, like, I don't, Unfortunately. I don't understand the whole point of the holo character anyway, because again, she's a type just like Leia, like this, she's a senator type in a gown, like, you know what I'm saying? Like just, why wouldn't you have someone who's against like a different type, like a gruff older guy, right? Who would, you know, because to me, the only reason, the only way the whole makes sense is that if she's, it turns out to be a villain working for the First Order. All right. Otherwise, her actions don't make sense to me. Well, yeah, her secrecy doesn't. Yeah. And then she has this stupid line here where she, she says, hope is like the sun. If you only believe it when you see it, you'll never make it through the night. Like, does, does Ryan think this stuff is profound? Or is he just making fun of Star Wars like language? Okay, I just don't like. And if she can t- say that, why can't she just tell him we're doing this? I don't know. I just I don't understand. Well, in in wait a minute, you could have her doing this if it turns out there is a first order spy. So, in other words, like if she doesn't know who it is. Mm-hmm. Right, then even just that one simple thing makes it that it turns out that it's like you then later realize, like, holy, like, shit, if the plan had been there, it would have happened. Of course, they're going to let Finn take the fall essentially for their code breaker being the one that's going to screw it up and everything. Because heaven forbid any plan by our heroes go anywhere near you know working um well it's a make it even worse i think in this same same scene poe he sees them fueling the tra- the transports like and she still refuses to tell him what is going on so he only so he can only deduce that they're just she's making you know that they're just like abandoning ship and it, like, right. why at that point would you not just fill him in because again, the contrivance of the plot requires this contrivance. Right. So then you have a basically a mutiny, right? Um, and even at this point, she still won't tell him, okay, to avoid bloodshed, here's what's going on. Nope. All all I can say to this is whenever, whenever someone throws no no joke on Twitter, whenever someone says last Jedi is a masterpiece, my mind instantly goes, always goes to this scene every single time. Why is this here? Why are we making space balls jokes? I know. I I don't even have words. Like, without losing control of my faculties and just cursing up a store, <laughs> like just. Well, the the thing is, is I I love the. You think it's one thing; it's actually another when it's done to an, a, a purpose. So there's, uh, I believe in, it's a Jurassic World. Like there's the, you think it's a dinosaur claw, it's actually the bird claw. Right. Um, is an, a, a little bit of example, because it at least ties into one of the things that the movie, you know, uh, at least the series is classically kind of done. But 
it, so when it's done to a certain effect, that's not my, that's not the best example because that one is a little bit more of a, again, played for a, uh, I don't want to say comedic effect, but it's definitely a little bit lighthearted. Um, but if this had turned out to be like some part of some apparatus that was winding up. So we thought it was a ship, but it turns out it was part of something that was going to mean something. But it's a freaking iron. And it's just freaking ironing shit. Mm -hmm. Like it just... Well, do we need to see ironing in Star Wars? I mean, beyond the fake out, it, it just... This is, it's like I try so hard. I try so hard to be generous with this movie, to get the benefit of the doubt. And it's just like, and then right after this, they put a, tra they put a trash can over BB-8. Because the joke is. Oh, the, 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 oh they, they undermine BB-8's awesomeness constantly in this film well because because it, it, to me this is like the joke is oh don't star wars always look like trash cans does r2 look like a trash can so we're gonna put a little trash can over bb8 which if there's a trash can in star wars everyone's gonna realize it, 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 why does this even work i just i just <laughs> i can hear you writing it off Literally. Oh. Scratching the pen <laughs> through. <laughs> yes. And then they're captured, and the whole plot was for nothing. Because this doesn't develop into anything. No. Like, other than, I guess, the world's longest contrivance to put them on here for the scene that's going to come next, which, again, is, it's, again, not worth everything sacrificed to the to move pieces there right because at the very least you could have done something where they're on the same ship as ray that that could have been but they don't even meet yeah i i just yeah if this had worked then at least even if the whole Canto white plot was stupid at least we would say well it amounted to something it doesn't even amount to anything And then the further indignity of Poe, like he's, he's taking control of the ship, and then Leia returns and freaking blasts him like he's a, and he flies across the room like a freaking clown. You know, it's just like, what did this character do to deserve this? Like <laughs> Han was a bigger scumbag and scoundrel in A New Hope, but he was oh, never and I guarantee, I and I guarantee you, if. Han had not sacrificed his life in the previous movie, he would be getting this treatment right now. Oh, you mean in a, uh, Force Awakens? Yeah. yeah. If he was still, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, seriously, though. Like, Han in New Hope, like I said, was, he was an actual scoundrel. But they still, like, in the next movie, he's treated with respect as like, you know, it's an honor to serve with you, Solo. Like, but, but Poe, what did he do? He was nothing but a, a decent guy in the first movie. Right. And he did all the good stuff that Han did as well. Like, <laughs> Right. Like, <laughs> With, without the, I'm going to take my money and leave. Like, he just, the whole time, he was just. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I actually I got, this, got two of those. Anyway. But in the, in the very next scene. Oh, this. Like, I missed this. The troublemaker, the last... but I like him. Right? I'm at, okay, imagine the year is 1940 and the roles were reversed. Um, you have two old, you know, male generals talking about some female. Like, that's the only way this makes sense. Like, this is, I feel like this is like sexism in reverse. Right, it's like they they stop, they they stop short of just slapping him on the butt. Right, I mean it's just, what is this? Like oh that old Poe, 
He's so stupid. Well, but dude. after well after everything, yeah, like, like, yeah. This like, is oh, like a, don't you know we just did this to toughen you up? Right. It feels like a, a like I said, a sexist movie from the forties, but the roles reversed. It really, it really kills me that Laura Dern, who I adore, I, I. I, I, it kills me that that she was reduced to playing this character. Like what? What? I was so excited when I when I heard that Laura Dern was going to be in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I was, and yeah. <laughs> so Ray is taken. To Snoke. Um, the interesting line that I, I wrote down was uh, when Snoke says, Darkness rises and light to meet it. I warned my apprentice as he grew stronger, his equal on the light would rise. Skywalker, I assumed. Now, knowing what we know now, was he right from a certain point of view? Like, did he have something in the, in the Prophetic in the Force. They told him Skywalker, but it's not the Skywalker. He was, right. he, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. So that's cool. Um, also in this scene, he takes, he takes credit for bridging their minds. Um, I mean, we know there's like a um, dyad component that we learn later. So whether like Snoke's mistaken or he just like opened them up to it, you know. I don't know. It's because it's open for debate. Um, and this this scene is like it could it could have been like really cool if it wasn't so telegraphed what was going to happen. You know, if they had like we didn't if we didn't know that I mean because they they show us right so that everything Snoke is saying and that the lights are returning. It's like like we know what's going to happen. Like it, it, I think they could have played it. A little bit more ambiguous, um, but I, re I remember seeing this though, and being when this happened when I first saw it for the first time, I was so pissed off. So it's like, oh, well, I guess we're not gonna, we're not going to learn anything then about Snoke. Like this whole thing was a setup because, like, going into this movie, you were like hoping, okay, well, who is he? What's he all about? You're right, and, exactly. And, again, like everything else in this movie, it's like, nope, you get nothing. You know. And it's well, the thing is, is I love this idea, yeah, of right. of 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 him dying like, this way. Like he he sees something, but not as it actually is, right? Because that's kind of a recurring thing: is the Sith being right from a point certain point of view, but not entirely correct, you know? Mm -hmm. And even the prophecy, right? Annika is the one that will bring balance to the Force. But it never said that he wouldn't leave it in tatters before bringing balance right. to the force, right? Um, but again, like you said, the minute he died, my thought was, it, it was just instantly like, what? Like, what? I spent the last two years, like, <laughs> right. wondering and pondering, like, you know, what, like, how are they going to set him up? What is his deal going to be? I, everyone was, you know, Oh, he's going to be Darth Plagueis. You know, there was all right. sorts of uh, of theories, and you know, and of course, you and I had uh, a thought of, you know, or and I think you agree, maybe agree with me a little bit on it to a certain degree. But I had the idea of it's like, what if the Vader component of Anakin? I was an entity unto itself. And this is essentially like uh, Ray was the reincarnation of the Anakin side. The, Snoke was the reincarnation of the Vader side of it. That, mm, right. that type of thing, right? And it was just going to be like, nope, Hugh Hefner is dead. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I was, I, I, this was probably the thing that pissed me off the most the first time through, like, because it, I think at this point, every single thing I had hoped out of this movie 
had just been like, that was it. Like this was the last one on the hit list. Um, and I described, I remember saying this on Twitter after force awakens came out, I described it like JJ Abrams breaking out the toy chest and lining up all of the figures and then saying, all right, here we are. Everything's back out. Someone, whoever's next, it's all in play for you to play with it. And Ryan Johnson was just like, nope. And just wiped all of it and threw all of it across and said, see, I subverted expectations. That, that was, that was my feeling this first time through the movie. And this was like the final straw for me where I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, he's dead. No, the sting of this is taken away because of what JJ did. Um, exactly. Right. Exactly. But I remember at the time, I think, in all honesty, I think this is the thing that probably pissed me off the most of the movie. Because there was so much, I don't know if people would say, well, it's your own fault, but there was so much about speculation on it. Because, okay, the thing is, if the dark side is beaten in Return of the Jedi, then the question is, okay, who is this other person? Where did it come from? Who, where is this? Like, it's a big thing. Like, you, like, for it to come back and you don't know who this person is. Right. And I think, and you, get, and you talk about the plague of speculation. People were doing that because it tied into Palpatine, because people were thinking, if this is a, you know, a nine film saga, like you've got to bring it back around somehow. If you're not doing Palpatine, then Snoke is the next best thing because maybe he wasn't dead. Maybe, you know, maybe he fixed, because you're assuming at this point, well, Palpatine's gone. But to me, this is why Palpatine did have to come back is because Ryan, like I said, wiped the board, um, leaving a huge vacuum. I mean, because after this movie, Kylo's not strong enough to carry the villain role in, in the next movie. Like you've got to have something else there um, for him to push against. Right. Especially the way the character, it is feasible that Kylo could have been maneuvered through this movie to be that villain. Mm -hmm. But, and I don't necessarily, I don't think I would have wanted Kylo to go that route. To be to be fair, not that I'm crazy about everything that was happening here. I don't think I would want Kylo to to push um, uh, into into that territory. I think there are better <laughs> things for him to be doing in terms of the character than um, setting him up to be like the big bad. Um, so, yeah, I'm. Yeah, this only I th I think the only reason I was not angry is again because I know I was going to get something, right? JJ's going to come and finish this. Um but but at this time I don't know anything. As far as I know, you just killed the only uh line I've got to any information, any chance of learning something. So uh, yeah, I was, yeah, this, like I said, this is probably the thing that, that, that made me the angriest. Um, and then, and then everything else kind of just, you're like, and everything else too, you know, <laughs> like, but this was, this was the straw that, that broke right. it for me. I feel, I really feel at that yeah. time. I agree. So we get the, um, the big fight, which it did time. not feel this that big this time to me. Yeah, because it's doesn't really change anything. It's obviously in place of what we, we typically get here, which is a lightsaber duel, which again we don't get in this movie. And yeah, it is it's just yeah. Well, one of the things, Josh, that you've the, the when you and I have talked about lightsaber duels, one of the things that you've always brought up is that every duel is a physical manifestation of another conflict, and the outcome of the duel is what signals the outcome of the conflict, right? Obi Wan and Anakin, you know, it that there's a meaning behind it, and so when Obi Wan bests Anakin, that that settles that situation in a certain in certain way you know all of you know coming back around the the lightsaber duel between obi-wan kenobi and darth vader 
again, the outcome of that settles something. Right. This this is just a fight. This is just a, a bar room brawl that happens to have two lightsabers in it um, that are directed at each other. And the way I watch it, just the choreography, um, I I love the idea, like because the something ignites, like the outside starts burning away. And I want to love I, the idea of this, but I have to admit, watching it for the third time, it feels very choreographed in a right. very hollow way. Right. Unfortunately, like it's got all the colors and all of the things that technically should make it pretty, but it, it really, it, it doesn't, unfortunately, I, and I really want it to, but to just be like, whoa, but well, at least that's a really cool fight. Uh, unfortunately it does. I think at final judgment, <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think it has a lot of like pretty visuals like this, but in uh, when it's fleshed out, it unfortunately feels hollow. Yeah, maybe I, it would be different if they came and fought after this, because then that like, would give some meaning. But yeah, exactly. So so Kylo, um, basically prompting Ray to say. Um, say it, you, you've always known. And she says, they were nobody. We're talking about her parents. And earlier on, Kylo had said, I know who your parents are. The thing about this is, there was no indication for Force Awakens that her parents were anyone special. Like, that was not the, that was not the question were her parents special is who were or where were their, her parents? That was the question. Or were they still alive? If they were special or not was the question being asked by the audience. So they're taking that and putting it into the movie. And that was never the question. So like when she says they were nobody, she never assumed they were anybody special. Right? Right. And this is, this is where the writer shows his hand as... At the audience, right, right, um, and it's very talk about something that has become a battlefield. Oh, right, more than anything is is this, you know? Oh, you didn't like this? Oh, well, then you are a you know, insert, you know, name calling well, here. Yeah, it's... Because I don't think for a second people are upset because the people who are married to Ray Nobody, that's the, that's the thing, right? I don't think it's because, well, this movie established that. So I, I think it has a lot to do with this whole... If Ray is not... They want Ray not to be connected to the legacy characters because you have a lot of people who are either new fans casual fans who aren't connected to the saga and the way people like us are. So to them, if they get this character where they can just, oh, she has nothing to do with all those. It's like a new character, not attached to all those old characters, right? That's what they're, that's what they're wanting out of this. In my opinion, in my view. Well, it's the, it's the same people on Mandalorian or like that were like, why are we dealing with Luke Skywalker? Why aren't we done with Luke Skywalker? Like it's that same mm -hmm. same group of people. Right. Anything that can disconnect it from the past, the legacy of the of the saga, that's what they're here for. Because they don't have the investment um that others of us do. So Ray goes for the saber, and then Kylo goes for the, at the same time. They have this, you know, push and pull, and and then no sooner do we get the lightsaber back than Ryan Johnson breaks it in half, just like everything else. But again, this is something that it gets like so much of this is like egregious, but then because of the next movie, it's like okay, well they make it better. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, and the thing is, is if we had felt that any of this was breaking with the intent of putting it together, that would have been one thing. But it very much feels like our intent is to break it and for it to stay broken. Like, yeah. That's it. Don't you dare touch this again. Um, right. you know, that's how it definitely felt first time through. You know, again, this is why we're revisiting it in the context of everything. So, like, uh, Leia and Poe have this conversation about Holdo where Leia says she thought it was more important that um, she protect the light than look like a hero with why she wouldn't tell her plan, which makes no sense. But no sooner after that, her saying Holo didn't want to be a hero, Holo goes and tries to be a hero, right? And wasn't like the whole Leia's whole big shtick at the beginning of the whole thing that she was so upset about in the beginning of the movie was a um, uh, bunch of dead heroes, no no leaders, right? That oh yeah, they won, but everyone was killed. It's like how is this any different? Ray's, I mean, Holo's going over there to be this hero and sacrifice herself. I mean. <sighs> It is a, it is different, but it is not different enough to warrant everything that has been said. Um, I mean, because this is this is a this is a scramble, because the only reason that Holdo is going to do this is a change of plan, because you know Ryan Johnson had Finn and Rose go and screw up with the you know. Benicio del Toro character. So he's betrayed them. And it's like, oh, they're, and I don't know how, by the way. I, I, I love that this is one of those things, how he even knows that they're like slipping away and doing this because it's not like he knew from Finn and, and all them. So I don't know when he magically has gleaned this information because it's supposed to be happening at the exact same time that they're on here. So it's not like he's on his ship and he's like, oh, I figured out the rebel's plan. It, it's just all of a sudden he conveniently has this information to sell them out with. It, so it's, it, so it is a change of plan that Holdo is doing this. But again... Yeah, but it's no less a... I, I don't know... I, I, like I said, it does not in any way negate the unnecess like the, the ridiculousness of the stuff earlier. It is a slightly different situation, but I, I'm not saying it justifies it. It's just well, yeah. If it wasn't, like, it, there's nothing wrong with this in in theory. It's just when the first half of the movie, you're mad at you know heroics that like, get people killed. And th so this, what is the point of this besides just to go, ha, 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 what an idiot. Ha, ha, how is he so stupid, right? But just not taking like, it. Even in, even in death. <laughs> well, yeah, especially in death. I mean, can you imagine? Darth Vader. The, wait a minute. I, I mean, the, the Luke... You know, when Luke cuts off the, the Vader head, it turns out to be him. Imagine this is the face that's hanging out of the mask, right? Like, yeah, I mean, just, just think about it. Like, imagine if you saw Palpatine like this in the Return of the Jedi or Darth Maul after he gets cut. I mean, come on. And then, like, I think he, like, uh, after that, he his body like falls over, like, and it's just more like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, yeah, because I think yeah, Hux comes in, and then you got the whole thing. It's like, what happened here? Yeah, like a sitcom. Yeah. <laughs> um. I I have grown to hate this planet 
I am just so sick of these visuals of the white and the red. Like, it just, like, it, it almost makes me cringe. Like, I don't know why. I just, I, I hate everything about this because especially, so they fly out in these old stupid chunker ships to buy some time or to destroy this mini Death Star laser. Which I guess is okay if we have a Death Star thing in this movie, but not in the others, right? Um, not one shot is fired by these these uh, rebel ships. Not once. So what what are they out there doing? Like it just feels like an intentional like I'm not even going to give you like the, a battle at the end. It just. I don't, I don't understand. Like, it to isn't this just this just more, uh, you know, deadly heroics. I my internal logic is the range on their weapons is extremely limited, and so therefore there's no point in firing. Oh, John, okay, I got to call BS on you on this one. No, 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 no. Come on, you know I that don't is know. not that is not what is going on here. If that was the case, they, I think it would have been said. And, 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 and the answer to that is you put them in range. Like, why would you not have a, a, a battle here? Besides, other than the fact that just not to have one. I mean, like, this was kind of cool. I like the flight through the caverns of the planet with the Falcon. Um, but it's a small thing. Yeah, so ultimately Finn has to fly. He has to fly his uh, ship into the maw of the weapon to destroy it. He's going to sacrifice his life, but then of course, Rose. Oh, you didn't make. Oh, you didn't take a picture of the shot. Well, well you talked about it after I would already. <laughs> yes, the worst in one of the worst insert shots I have ever seen. The of Rose just coming in at this like impossible angle of just and it's like it's a split second, but I think it might be like my like your Force Awakens. Like, why does Han look at like this in this like one shot? It, mm -hmm. it, it it's this very rare, it's just, it's just so, it's so bad. Yeah, it. Um, I honestly thought the first time I saw the movie, I thought she died. Well, she does slump over at the end of the scene, like right. Like she is dead, and I and, and, and then I, I this time I realized like okay, there's subsequent scenes with like right. her getting medical help or whatever. But I literally, when Rise of Skywalker came out, I was like, what a bold move by JJ. He brought Rose back from the dead, like. <laughs> I I I one hundred ten percent thought she died. Yeah, somehow Rose, Rose Tico returned. I this is so contrived. It, well, it feels the, there's just nothing here. Well, then she says, "That's how we're gonna win: not fighting what we hate, but saving what we love." I don't believe for a second that even Ryan Johnson believes this to be true. Like, this is the most nonsensical statement. I mean... It sounds so profound, though. And you, I would argue that you could set up a scenario in which this could be a powerful statement. But, you know... Now, I did not want Finn to die here. But, again, it was... A determinant. Nope, we got to take it away. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I don't want him to die. I didn't want him to, you know, but yeah, it just, but this, this, this was the most, everything between these two characters is the most manufactured 
just it, I I just I'm not buying it, and I, and I'm not feeling it. Well, how come all. no one, no one how come no one flew into Holdo's ship to stop her from destroying herself? <laughs> you know, how come no one saved that thing? I guess no one loved her, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like this movie contradicts its own like logic, scene to scene. Um. So, like, in the theater, I was thought this was amazing. Luke showed up. Yay. It's, you know, you think, oh, things are turning around. So, like, he hands her the, the dice from the Falcon, right? She actually holds them in her hand. He gives her a kiss. Physical contact, right? But anyway, it's still a nice, it's, it's a nice scene regardless of all that. Um, and I like, I love this when, you know, 3PO says, Master Luke, and he winks at him. Um, should be noted, this was not Ryan Johnson's idea. It was not in the script. This was Hamill's uh, thing. that He said, I think I should, you know, wink or do something with 3PO. So credit to him for that. In these moments, I think are really epic. Like I, I was all in when this was going on. I thought, oh, we're actually going to get you know the big Luke Skywalker moment. You know, um, I was really excited when I saw this the first time. And then, like you know, I fire all the shots, and he's untouched. I'm thinking, wow, he's this you know super powerful force user. We're really seeing him do his thing. But then we start getting, we get this non-dual and you very quickly realize they're not never even touching. Sabres never come into contact. Um, so the frustrating thing about this is they've gone out of their way to establish, even up seconds ago, that this force projection thing, there's a physicality to it. Um, things can transfer or whatever. But then they go out of their way to make sure that Luke never touches because he can't because he's just a projection. But that goes against all the logic you've already set up. Like how cool this would have been if you had actually fights him with a saber that's not really there. It would have been but amazing. Then that, but, well, but then that would give us a lightsaber battle. Exactly. So he's defying his own logic just so he can... You know, piss in our face. Essentially, <laughs> maybe that's too harsh to say, but that's how it feels. It's like you can't even uphold the only, your, things you set up. Kills me on this one. It, the um, like, there's this like slow mo like thing, and it, I, yeah, yeah. It this is this is extremely because this could easily be extremely epic. Yes. And it starts to slowly, you're just like, your heart starts to Well, sink. and especially, especially if you have it, like they're fighting the duel, and there comes a moment where essentially Luke lets Kylo think that he's got him, and that's when it goes right through him. Right mm -hmm. after there's been all the, like, after Kylo has, like, seen this, there, no, you, our lightsabers... Like your saber stopped mine. Like it'd be even amazing if it actually like singed him. But then it's gone. Yeah. Like Luke can right. choose at will when he is there physically versus just an illusion. Um but of course they go and show like, oh, his foot breaks make make no, you know, step. Which again, that makes no sense either. Right. It just I mean, again, you could make it make sense where it's like he chooses like my hands in touching Leia, my, you know, it, you could make it work, but you don't do, he doesn't do anything with it here. So it's just like you said, it just, it just comes across to just, you're just pissing on us here. Mm -hmm. You're not getting your lightsaber duel. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah. So like it just, yeah, this this scene right, right there. Yeah. Um. 
so Kylo has a fit, and then Luke says, you know, in response, every word of what you said is wrong. The rebellion is reborn today. The war is just beginning, and I will not be the last Jedi. Which is cool, but again, it's just you get these little cool bits, but they're all just buried under this all this mountain of frustration, you know. And like simultaneously, Ray is um, lifting the rocks to help the rebels escape. I think you have something to say about this. We were talking. Well, well, this is this is supposed to play, come off as this big epiphany moment for Ray because there's something that's said earlier that's essentially like the force is just not moving a bunch of rocks, and then it's like the force is moving a bunch of rocks, like because it's right. all about what you do with the power of the force. Um, but again, it comes across as so hollow. Like I want it, I. I love moments like what this is supposed to be. I love moments like that, where the thing you thought in one ray is in fact true. Like you thought this was false, but it was actually true. Or what you thought was true is true in a different way. I love that kind of twist to things, but this just feels so hollow. Like it's like it's just a right. first draft of a of an idea. Yeah. So yeah, I I, I want to love this scene because especially like Poe's frustration at like, look, I got it. We figured it out. We're going to find our way out. And then it's. Well, because there's really nothing surprising about Ray being able to lift rocks. I and mean, we know that she can do things. I mean, it's, I don't know. It doesn't come across as this big it's moment. I mean, it's technically. But I think the thing is, is it we needed to see her struggle to do something this big, like or maybe not being able to lift stuff on the island, like she was. Right, you know. exactly, right. So in other words, we'd seen her, and that uh, this was a common thing that that's been levied at the movie, and it it is true, having gone through it again, that like Ray really doesn't suffer anything in order to be able to move forward and grow. Like it just. And for the most part, everyone just is either going steps backwards, or in Ray's case, she just well, she's not a, in a much different place. Right. There's her struggle with the dark side and stuff, and like the whole parents thing, which is misguided. But the thing about Star Wars is that you have to have a physical representation of the struggle you've gone through. Right. Luke finds out Vader's his father, and he loses his hand. Right. Um, Anakin. Um, loses a hand, you know, and then um, sort of symbolizing his detachment from the Jedi Order, right? And it's like Ray doesn't suffer anything, you know, as far as that goes. Um, just a nice shot of Daisy Ridley. That's all. <laughs> I, I knew there'd be at least one more in here. <laughs> I want to get one more in. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I can't help it. So yeah, here's the moment. And it's, again, like watching this in the theater, it's like I go from intense, crushing disappointment and you see this and I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't see that coming. Because um, I think the idea of this is, is, is actually really awesome uh, as far as projecting and stuff. Um, and then like, uh, he falls over and you think, oh crap, he's died. Right. And then you see, oh no, he's not dead. Good. And then he's, 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 he's with us, right? He's, we're going to see Luke again. and he's dead. And it's just a roller coaster and there's and this like brief, and you're just like, you don't, like, the thing is, it's like. See, the whole projecting thing, like, it's a cool idea. But, like, what sucks about it is, ultimately, Luke does not show up. He does not leave the island. Like, I think there's a way you could have done this to where maybe the First Order or something showed up at the island and, like, left him stranded or injured. Where you think, oh, he can't do anything. He can't leave. And then he does this at the end. That would have been awesome, right? Like, 
because basically the only thing standing in his way, the only obstacle he has is himself. Um, I would have been okay if Luke died. Like, I'm okay with Luke dying in this movie if he does if he's heroic through the most of the movie. Um, but the fact that he's not and he dies, I think, is what hurts. Is that you don't really get to see Luke be Luke. Um, in my opinion, because I do think that at some point in this trilogy, Luke needs to die because he needs to become a Force ghost, like like Obi Wan before him. Well, like, him. but but he's he's the Yoda of the movie, and right. what happens he's, to Yoda in Return of the Jedi. So well, that's, that's it, what the master does. Yeah, the master. So like he does need to die at some point, but it's just how he dies. And like I think that's the issue is that you finally get him back, and then it's just like it feels a little bit empty. Like it, yeah, it's heroic in a sense, but he always already wanted to die. He, those were his words. So like it's just you know, so it, it loses it. Go ahead. I just realized. Of course, not this movie. <laughs> because oh. it's a good thing. So therefore, hey, but you're just talking about the master dying and the student rising up. But just the complete, the, the, the symmetry to that, but also the complete difference between how this we have seen this happen with the Jedi versus how we have seen it happen with the Sith. And again, just, you know. Right, more beautiful symmetry for those who actually understand the franchise for which they're writing. <laughs> so yeah, this is the shot um, with the books on the Falcon. Again, the ending of this movie is so bizarre too because it it's almost like a Return of the Jedi style celebration, you know. And it like, I remember the feeling of it was like, where does it go from here? Like you killed your big villain. Well, I mean, that's literally what Ray asked with the like. Where do we where do we go with this? And it's like, yes, Ryan, where do we go from with this? I wonder who made this mess with this broken lightsaber. <laughs> yeah, so like it just it just ended with this weird. Feel well, and of course this this is not even the end because we get this. Oh, thing that, that, yeah, this tack on right here because it ends right where you're like. Oh, right. That's how it's supposed to end. Like, this is how Star Wars ends. Nope. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna break that convention, too. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, oh. this just, just feels like, you know, the whole time Ryan's, you know, pissing on her hero heroism, you know, noble characters and all this stuff. And then the brain, no, just kidding. It, it's all good. Like, it's just like, really, this does not make that all that okay. Right, because you do prior to this, you have a scene with with this this boy where he's like basically relating the the battle, you know, and you can't hear what you don't understand the language they're speaking. So they're just like duh, duh, duh. it's kind of like with um C three PO talking in the Ewok village, duh, 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 Master Skywalker, and everything. But you basically realize like oh, it's like the legend does matter, the story does matter, but like you said, it it. Because it's in this little tacked on thing, it does feel like, like you said, like, a, oh, I'm just joking. Like, do, like <laughs> yeah, like, don't hate me. Right? Otherwise, right? Yeah, right. And the um, number of people that fixated on this broom boy the, the, of, the, of like Twitter like, people, I are, love are, that. I love that yeah. they were upset that Rise of Skywalker doesn't tell the story of broom boy. But meanwhile, for all of us that we're all excited for the continuation of a story with Snoke, and it kills. Like, I don't know. I, Twitter is such a freaking bizarre. Like, I'll say alternate universe. I think that's being too kind to it. I don't. I don't. I don't understand. So, this is the end. Okay, it, I think I'm going to get the closing shot of. Um, it says, you know, written directed by Ryan Johnson. 
this is the only one that had no collaborators. He all did, he just wrote it and you know did it himself. JJ, you know, he wrote the first one with Horace Kazan and also worked extensively with George Lucas, contrary to popular belief. That was very much out there at the time leading up to the movie that even Lucas's son said JJ and Lucas would talk every day um, for a time. Um, and then of course Rising Skywalker, it's 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 JJ and Chris Terrio, you know, but no, Ryan thought he could just go this alone and um the results speak for itself. No, I, I like I said, I fully believe this is a Ryan Johnson movie with the skin of Star Wars grotesquely stretched over it. And this is notoriously the only Star Wars movie that had no behind the scenes troubles, that everything just went so smoothly that they greenlit his own trilogy, you know, before this was even out. And I think this speaks to Kathleen Kennedy's mindset on what she likes versus, you know, um, whatever. So, do you have, what are your final thoughts? I mean, I think we've probably talked, I mean, this again, this is one of those movies that's been discussed to death. We probably offered nothing really much new. What is also well, I mean, it's, here's the thing. This is a, this just to show. This is kind of the process of how we've gone back through this movie, right? L what we've been looking for, because one of the things that I think is very rarely done is to have gone back and to reevaluate this, right? And it, it would have been easy to just say, ah, whatever, it was garbage, and write it off. Just well, we wrote it off before, so just keep it written off, right? I I think everything great it has to offer, it only has to offer because JJ went back and pulled it out of the trash. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, I mean, unfortunately, because the thing is, is JJ did his best to try and give this pointlessness context. Right. You know, it, 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 this wasn't taking this anywhere. Part of the biggest frustration for this is I would probably be more open to a movie dealing with the universe of Star Wars in this manner if it were just like some, you know, Ryan Johnson presents some random Star Wars story. I could probably deal with a lot more of this and be like, okay, fine, whatever, I'll roll with it. But to stick this in the middle of, and I know that they weren't necessarily planning for it to be a trilogy, but still, to stick this as the second movie in something that you're building up for, in bringing Star Wars back, in doing what, like what Ghostbusters Afterlife did an excellent job in, which is to... We need to bridge the gap between our legacy and our future. And so we need to have our legacy characters have a situation in which they interact with our new characters in a way to be able to close out a chapter seamlessly to roll into a new one. That's what this needed to be doing. And this was the film that was supposed to be doing that with Luke. Because we got it with Han. like. The Force Awakens is very much Han's movie. And the way I think this was supposed to play out is this was supposed to be Luke's movie and Leia was to be a driving force between the, in, in the final film. That's really the way I saw this kind of going. And so for you to step in and go, okay, this is Luke Skywalker's movie. Let's make him take the piss every chance we can. Like, this is not the time or place. This is one of those things where it's like, you want to ask someone, it's like, read the room, too. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of like, even if this were, even if this were doing what it's doing, but somehow still a masterpiece, like whatever, however you want to imagine that happening, 
it's still in completely poor timing and taste. It's it's kind of like someone who's an amazing axe thrower and they're going to put on their act, an amazing axe thrower, but they decide to put it on during an event that is all about um, people who have survived axe murders. Like, is this really where you want to be doing this particular show? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Read the room. Read the situation. And it, it just, it didn't matter. It was, you know, Ryan, you know, the other, because the other thing too is, because I've been thinking, I've been thinking about this also, just looking at Ryan Johnson's career. Because So here's the thing. I love the <laughs> brick. I have not gone back to it since this, but I loved brick. I liked 99% of Looper. I felt like it had a ending needed to be edited a little bit tighter, but I, for the most part, liked the film. And then all of a sudden you get like this. So I didn't come into this being like, who's this guy? This is going to suck. I came in going like, okay, uh, Colin Trevorrow, who I didn't necessarily think had any background that was going to deliver in the incredible film that Jurassic World was, it is possible for someone to step into something they have not done and deliver something brilliant. So I wasn't necessarily like, yes, but I also wasn't completely against this. At first I was like, oh, okay, well, I like this. One of the things I've noticed is about those films they are a lot tighter and a lot safer because I think he knew he had to actually deliver something because he can't ride on anything's coattails. He doesn't have anything else. So you have to actually deliver a movie that delivers something for its audience. This is Star Wars. Everyone was going to show up to the movie theater anyway. And it's kind of like, so I don't have to do any of the work to actually earn those people watching my movie, I can throw whatever I want up there and they're going to show up. And so therefore you get, you get this because it didn't matter what he did. Everyone was going to show up for it based on the goodwill of everything that came before it. And so I think part of it is as well is just the, I don't have to do the work. So why should I, I get to do whatever I want. And this no. just feels like, uh, it feels exactly like the movies he has made after this, but with Star Wars thrown on it. Like all the same writer's sensibilities in terms of what is important to him, what he thinks is interesting. So the, my final thoughts, Josh, is that I'm I'm finally at peace with this thing. It's a, it's a bad Star Wars movie. <laughs> but... Mm. But it is not the complete derailment, unsalvageable, canon-wrecking mess that people make it out to be. It is frustrating as all get out. But ultimately, well, it by has it ruined by Star Wars to the point that, like, oh, whatever comes after this has to suck. Well, because right? by avoiding so many points where it could have given us something like I said it doesn't break Star Wars it doesn't it doesn't break I mean, it doesn't break the universe it right. does break the chain of the films in terms of the the, the connection of visual style and all of those yeah. things but it does not break the universe of Star Wars in yes. terms of being able to continue the story actually I never even thought about it the way that you're saying because it avoided ever doing anything it also meant its cuts couldn't run to the bone. Well, it's not like it's not like you know Doctor Who that like actually altered its own canon like fundamentally to the core, right? Right. Um, this is just like a completely unfortunate detour. Right. It's just a it's a yeah. it's a waste of time. Yeah. But so I'm I'm much more at I'm much more at peace with it. Um. So I but guess it seems like it seems like you were. <laughs> what? It seems like 
I, I, I watch this like one more time and it's like, okay, fine. I can live with this thing. feels like, I think it might've frustrated you a little bit more this, this well, time through. It, it did because I'm someone who's definitely a more, I'm not a sequel hater. Um, I never let this movie affect my enjoyment of the other two movies. Um, but I've kind of held it as an abstraction in my head. Um, and this is the first time that we're really I've, getting but down. Really, and... Yeah. And so like, and, and the other thing too is like, I approached it again, like almost every time I've watched this movie, I approached it with like, okay, I'm going to try to like it this time. Like I want to be, you know, and it's like this time in particular, which is more like, you're just not working with me at all, are you? Like, it's just like, it's the same <laughs> movie. but it just, I mean, it felt more frustrating in a lot of ways. So I, I, I hate that I, if I came off just exasperated, but look, it is what it is. Okay. Um, I did have sort of a realization though, at the end of this, um, thinking about the trilogy as, as a whole. Um, in a lot of ways, both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi are not so much Star Wars movies, but they're movies about Star Wars. The difference is The Force Awakens treats Star Wars with reverence. It's it's like a, largely about like the myth and the cultural impact of Star Wars and what it's meant to all of us. You know, talking about oh Luke Skywalker and like the four like and like you know like again like all the, the the wreckage of the you know what we saw in the original trilogy. There's a reverence. I guess, I guess we talked several times during the, our review that it was very meta. This movie is the same way, but from the other, other point of view. It's saying all that is silly. You shouldn't take it seriously. Um, and it's, it just seeks to undermine right? the, the myth, the, the heroism, um, all the things we've come to like, you know, be inspired by with Star Wars. So, like, there are really two sides uh, of a coin, right? Um, Interesting, because, of course, always the comparison is two, you know, is eight to nine, not necessarily seven to eight. Yeah, so, but the, so, there's, so the interesting thing about this sort of our segue to next week, Rise of Skywalker is really the first, after all of these, true star wars movie that charts its own course it's telling it's a it's it's a pure it's a pure adventure it doesn't have um it's not trying to say anything profound as far as outside the world of star wars it's trying to tell the best in my opinion the best star wars movie you could tell with considering where it was at where this the saga was left after this movie. Um, it's um, it really is dealing with the saga um, at face value. Um, I think it's the only film that really does that of these three. So that's maybe one reason why spoilers. I enjoy it so much because it feels in a lot of ways, the most Star Wars of them all. So. Well, there you, there you have it. <laughs> but. Profound we, revelation at the end <laughs> of all of this. But we are going to go, we're going to tackle this one next week. And I am, I, in many ways, this is the one I've been looking forward to the most. This is what I probably have the most to say about this one is the one that has been most dismissed by both sides of the argument uh, of the, you know, argue the culture war, whatever. Um, so because it's been dismissed, I don't think it has been discussed and hasn't been um, talked about um, at least in the right way or any kind of, you know, meaningful way. So, I mean, really, I Rise of Skywalker is why we have gone through Force Awakens right. and uh, and Last Jedi. I, I mean, also, Force Awakens was a bit of wanting to reset and roll back the revisionist history. 
um, there's definitely that element to it. But why we've done this the way we've done it is to lead up to Rise of Skywalker. Right, because it, it was the one that was written off before anyone saw it. Um, Last Jedi was like people had already seen it, you know, reactions were what they were. But because of the things that ensued, Rise of Skywalker was prejudged. Um, and fair shake, in my opinion. Um, just me saying I was going to see the movie, I got people yelling at me on Twitter. Like, how dare you go see the movie? And it's just like, it, like, and the thing was, it's like, if you were mad at Ryan Johnson, if you're mad at Disney, they went and brought back the guy who made the successful one. Like, you're, you're mad for at Disney for not listening to you, but then they go and like, try to to their credit maybe the one of the few things they have done right um that's what i don't understand i don't understand why jj now is like on this up on the same cross that ryan johnson is like why is he being crucified you know doesn't mean you have to like his movies but it's like he's paying for ryan's sins that's what i don't understand about this whole thing anyway i've probably gone too too far off on left uh Left filled with that. That's for next week. Um, <laughs> do you have uh, anything close I to have, close us out? I, I, I have, I, I have said, I have said my piece. You got a jug of green milk over there. You can. Yeah, I've got my. You know, just one. You know, one more time, just for good measure. Play us out. Play us out. Put it up. Put it up. Play us out, Josh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>